Glory to God. Hallelujah. All right, James chapter 5 and verse 17. Very quickly, James chapter 5 verse 17. Revelations 8, 4 to 5. Two portions of scriptures, James. By now you should be able to quote James from your head. Right? James chapter 5. And then verse 17. And then I'm going to read the New King James Version. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Verse 18 says, and he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain. And the earth produced its fruit. Revelation chapter 8. I mean, if you don't know where Revelation is, you can just... Leave it. Revelation is like the book of the endings. Revelation chapter 8. Are you there? Are you there, people of God? Revelation 8, 4 to 5. The Bible says, And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer filled with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and earthquake. You are most of us had it said that whatever goes up must come down. So when your prayer goes up, see what the angels do. The result on the earth is that there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and earthquake. For a few minutes, even this morning, I'll be speaking of men of like passion. Look at your neighbor and say, Men of like passion. Okay, you can also call it women of like passion. So if you, <laughs> but you know, there is no sex and gender in the spirit in the in the in your spirit that means that you can't find a feminine or a masculine spirit your spirit is gender neutral do you understand that so i'm speaking on men of like passion the bible says in king james version it said elijah was a man of like passion and he prayed so today we want to look at men of like passion father thank you because the entrance of your word, we give light, we give understanding unto the simple. As simple people, we've come today to learn at your feet. I make my tongue the pen of a ready writer. And I write the word of life upon the spirit of your people. After now, make us better people. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. You can have your seat in God's presence. Men of like passion. Men of like passion. If you can look at the screens and look at the names and the pictures on the screen. There's no names there. The pictures on the screen. You will see that these people are not men that come from the same tribe. But there is something that is unique about them. is the fact that all of them have stood for God in their generation. Uh, perhaps not the person you are looking at the picture who is just standing up for God for his generation. Amen. So, what is that thing that is unique about them and you can find in their life? If you have ever found a person who stood for God, and if you are ever going to stand for God in your generation, if you are ever going to stand for God in your generation, there's one thing you and I must do. And that is one thing you will see that is in the life of these people. And it seeks the fact that they were people of prayers. I've said a lot of things about prayer, so today is just my conclusion. Today you just came for the concluding service. And what I want to do today is a very simple thing. Because you see, there is a way you can make theory and talk about theory and people will... Say, what are you talking about? I want to just bring out and bring before us certain pictures of certain men uh, who traveled with God in their time so that you can find examples in scriptures for whatever it is you are going through. And you can know that if it can happen for them, then it can also happen for you. So I want to bring out pictures to you. But before then, can I say a little thing about prayer as a means of beginning? Number one, prayer is not something we get involved in because we don't have anything else to do. Prayer is the means of communing and communicating with God. Prayer is the means of communing and communicating with God. Prayer is the God-given way of assessing heaven. Alright? If you are going to assess heaven, then you have got to pray. Can I say that to somebody again? If you are going to assess heaven, then you've got to pray. Prayer is the means by which you are going to assess heaven. Without prayers, you will not be able to get into God's throne room. God's holy place, his throne room, what I love to call the treasure house of God. Huh? The treasure house of God is where all of God's treasures are. 
before you can access it, you would have to be a person of prayer. Because prayer is the means of accessing his treasure out. So what is it that you need? Uh, finances? You need a job? Uh, you need God's blessing? You need fullness of life? Uh, you need long life? You need prosperity? You need health? You need relationship? All of them are available in God's treasure house. But you cannot access it except you're a person of prayers. Except by praying. Now let me say this to us. Uh, that in the Old Testament time, uh, there was something called the inner chambers, the inner room, uh, the, where the master seat was kept. And only one person can access that place. So it's called the throne room, where the Ark of the Covenant stayed. But there was only one person at a time. So in the whole of Israel, there is only one person. His name is called the high priest. It is only the high priest that could enter into what is called the treasure house of God's presence. It is him alone that could see the presence of God. This man alone in the whole of Israel. Listen, if you have talked about Buga, this is the greatest of Bugas. I mean, I am the only one that can enter into the place where Jehovah lives, where Jehovah dwells, where Jehovah decides that I priest alone. They started out with the man by the name of Herod. But by the reason of death, there was no continuity. So there came a time that Aaron also gave it to his son by the name of Phineas. And so they had people who come and go because of death, son. And they alone could enter into the presence of God. But thanks be to God. Jesus came. And the veil that divided the holy from the unholy. The veil that divided the presence of God where the mercy seat stayed. Even from the place where everyone could enter. Scripture says when he died on the cross, the veil was cut into half. Not from the floor, which is how you will cut. But scripture says he was cut from half even to down. That tells you that it takes God himself to cut it down. Because God was saying, I want access with my children. I'm not convenient. I'm not convenient. I don't love it anymore. And I can only speak to one person. I want all of my children to be able to enter into my throne room. And that's why we speak about prayers. Because there is a God who is interested in meeting up with you. Let me say this to us. You can never have the presence or go and access the presence of the president of this nation. Do you know you can't? Except he himself desire that you come. So it is impossible for a normal and a common person to be in the presence of royalty somebody following me. It therefore suggests something to us. That it is impossible, absolutely impossible for you and I to go into God's presence if he was not the first person that says come. Therefore Hebrews chapter 4 and then verse 10. If I say come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 17. He said come let us reason together. So the invitation is given by God. Therefore, have you honored God's invitation? Has anybody ever invited you to a party and you didn't show up? Or have you ever invited people for a party and they didn't show up? How do you feel? There is an invitation of God upon our lives. Everyone is inviting us. The question is, are we going to answer? Listen to this. There are no limitations when a man can pray. In the place of prayer, limitations are swallowed up. And today, I want to take from scriptures and give you examples of men who in the place of prayer have achieved great things. And I'll be taking them one by one. So this is like an historical study. And then I would also from there take you to men who are not stories, who are not written in the book of the law, whose story are not written in the Bible, so that you can have an understanding of what we're speaking about. Men of like passion. Alright? The first person I want to speak about is the man by the name of Enoch. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 5 verse 24 that Enoch was not because God took him. Did you see that? Enoch was not because what happened? God took him. I said that last week that I perceive what happened with Enoch was simple. It was that, you know, the scripture says that you should build up yourself on your most holy faith. What should you do? Praying in the Holy Ghost. And I said as you pray in the Holy Ghost, you build up yourself. That means you, you begin to grow higher and higher and higher and higher. I said that what I think happened to Enoch was that Enoch had built such great an edifice that he had reached God's level. 
So that as he began to pray, he just entered from that chamber and God said, you are not going home anymore. He just took him. The Bible did not say he died. He said, and God did what? God took him. He, he, he had built up himself in prayer. And I was saying that when you see certain men and you feel like God always answers their prayers. I mean, people trepidate when men like Baba Deboye preach. They say, this one that close to God. When Bishop Oedipo declares it, they say, it will happen. Do you think they were born that way? No. They had built themselves up higher and higher and higher and higher until they become like they are seeing the face of God. Enoch. Prayer is there for, what can we learn from that? Is that prayer is there for intimacy with God. Prayer is communion with God. Prayer is koinonia with God. I, 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 can, I may not close my eyes, but I may be in communion with God. Are you following me? I may not even open my mouth, but I may be in communion with God. Because, let me say this to you, the older a couple gets, the less they talk. Therefore, even when they are looking at each other, they are communicating. And they are saying, when did you tell him that? When did you tell him that? They are in silence, but their eyes are speaking. It means that their relationship has gotten to a depth that is even more than words. You can get to depth with God that God can know what you are thinking. Have you ever said it and said, I did not pray and God answered it? I, I don't know whether that has happened to you before. You did not pray. You were just thinking something was just going on in your heart. And God did it. Number two, look at Abraham. Let's look at the man by the name of Abraham. Abraham was so conversant with God that God gave him a tagline. I love it. He said, Abraham, my friend. Will God call you his friend? Can God say, oh, damn it, my friend. Can God look at you and say, oh, Desmond, my friend. You know, it's a level that you get to that God says, you know, when we say, Desmond, my friend, Abraham, my friend, the import of that was that God was saying, will I do a thing without sharing it with him? Because friends share. Yeah. So what am I trying to say is that when you become a friend of God, you become a custodian of the secret of heaven. Therefore, God will not do a thing on the heart without telling you first. That's what it means to be a friend of God. It means that you have come into a place where you begin to intercede even on the behalf of men. Prayer grants you access to deal in God affairs. Do you like that? It grants you access to deal in God affairs. They say, no, only God can do these things. You say, don't worry. I am here. I can do it. Why? Because I know the God of heaven. Do you remember that name, that man by the name of Daniel? Scripture says the king had a dream. And they told the king, they said, tell us the dream and we will tell you the meaning of the dream. And the king said, no, I know you are wasting my time. You have to tell me the dream and the interpretation. And they looked at him and said, no man on earth can ask this of his wise men and his astrologers. And he said, if you don't give me the dream, I'm going to kill all of you. And they were sentenced to death. But listen to this. Listen to this. There is a God that really knows the heart of man. Daniel said, give me time. And he entered into the place of prayer, sir. And he came out of the place of prayer and gave the king the dream. They began to relate to him as God. You know what they said? They said, him would the spirit of the gods have been found in him. Daniel chapter 5 and then verse 12. He said, he would the spirit of the gods have been found in him. It means that he had entered into a space and a sphere that they knew this guy is no longer normal. Abraham could stop a kingdom from being destroyed because he was a friend of God. Number three person, very quickly, the man by the name of Moses. I love Moses. He's like no other man. Moses exploit in prayer doubting. God said, I want to destroy Israel. He said, don't do it. He said, don't do it. He said, the people will say that you are not able to deliver them to the land of promise. That's why you destroyed them. <laughs> Imagine that boldness in talking to God. You see, he got to a point with God that the Lord spoke to him. The Bible says in Exodus 3 verse 11 that the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. He spoke to him face to face. Little wonder Moses was so daring. 
You know, it got to a point in 33, 18 of the book of Exodus. Moses said, that I may see your face. Ah, ah. It's so, have you prayed that prayer before? You have been praying now for daily bread. You've been praying for new businesses. But he said, that I may see your face. God had to educate him. He said, no one can see my face and leave. What you are asking for is impossible. He said, no man sees my face and leave. He said, but I will take you. There is a side by me. He said, I will pass before you. And then I will remove my hand and you will see my glory. That glory that I was talking about is what the Hebrew called kabod. It is the weightiness of God's presence. It is the splendor and the magnificence of his presence. So what Moses saw was the magnificence of God. If you want to see the magnificence of God on your business, in your life, then you need to enter into the place of prayers. He had grown so bold. Moses, a man who was in the book burning bush and he was afraid to even be sent by God had got it to a point in his life. He was saying, God, I want more. God, I want more. He said, and he said, I beseech thee, show, show me thy glory. Show me thy glory. Number four, Joshua. You know Joshua? Joshua was the disciple of Moses. Listen, open your Bible. You see, there are things in scriptures that I want to show you today. Joshua chapter 10. Please go there. I don't know what that thing is in your family that they are saying cannot be moved. I don't know that mountain that you came to church with. I don't know what has been troubling you and stopping you from sleeping. I don't know the thing the devil has been pushing at you. But you have come to an encounter with God this morning. Joshua chapter 10. Joshua chapter 10. Are you there? Are you there? <laughs> Do you know the verse I'm going to? Is there a Daniel here? Who knows? <laughs> Joshua, Joshua chapter 10. And then go very quickly to 12 and 13. Joshua, Joshua 10, 12 to 13. Listen to this. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorite before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand still over Gibeon, a moon in the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped. See, the people had revenge upon their enemies. Listen to this. Study of geography told us that there is a day that is missing, even in the world. You can go and Google it. So what happened here is not a, it's not a myth. It's not a myth. It, is, it actually happened. The man stopped cosmos because he was a man of prayer. He, he, he stopped cosmos. You see, that is not something you enter today. It is something you begin to build consistently. Joshua loved the presence of God. The Bible says that, and when the presence of the Lord will come even into the tent in, in Israel, and Moses, the son of the Lord, would have ministered. The Bible says when Moses leaves, Joshua stays behind. He just loved the presence. Little wonder he got to a point of boldness. That's why I talk about men of life passion. He has seen Moses demonstrated power in God. And he knew that he can also do it also. So he said, moon, stand still. You know, many people are not in church today because rain fell on the mainland. <laughs> I wish somebody could say rain, stand. Rain, stop. This man said it without the permission of other people. Imagine if you were there in Israel that day, you want to sleep. There was this man, the sun is out. One of the culture shock of people who live in Nigeria is that when it is 3 a.m., it looks like it is 5 p.m. Because the, it's so bright. They wonder what's going on. Imagine that's happening in Nigeria. You have closed. You are in traffic. You are trying to get home by 9 p.m. and the sun is still shining. Now, when you read scriptures, you must understand that behave like you, it, it happened. So imagine you are there. Imagine this guy was on the island who stopped it. At the Bejuleki, the guy stopped it. Now, you are probably just finding your way around that cookie. 10 p.m., the sun is still shining. You will cuckoo it and say, is there an eclipse of the sun or eclipse of the moon? And there's not. So you get up, 2 a.m. You woke up because, you know, you are thinking traffic. So you slept. 
And then you woke up suddenly, 3 a.m., and the sun is bright. Say, I am I'm late. I'm late. My own. And then you check the time, 3 a.m., you will not believe it. You will check another wristwatch. You know what happened? A supernatural man had done that. If God can stop the sun and the moon because of a man that prays, what can he not stop? Is somebody following me? Let me give you another man. No, what did we learn? Prayer is the means of invoking the spiritual in order to make the impossible possible. So prayer is only invocation. To him that prays, nothing is impossible. Now, let me give you another one. Number five, Anna. Have you heard of Anna? Anna was called a barren woman. But Anna was a God lover. Certain things might not be working in your life. Are you following me? But if you are a God lover, you will not miss out. If you are a lover of God, you will not miss out. Anna was a God lover. A fantastic lover of God. And her story is well written in 4 Samuel chapter 1. The woman went to Shiloh. The barren woman went to Shiloh. Are you following me? Don't get distracted. Just, just, just follow me. She went to Shiloh. Barren. She was not depending on her husband to pray. Because her husband was not going to pray the way he was praying. Because her husband had children already. When you are depending on somebody who has a job to pray for you for a job. When you are depending on somebody who is married to pray for you for a relationship. They will pray, but it will not never be like the way you will pray. Anna prayed differently. Anna prayed differently. As scripture says, when the high priest Eli saw her, he said, at this hour you are drunk? He said, no, I'm not. There must be something different about our intercession. There must be something different about our prayer. And she prayed. And she got answers. Prayer is the means of latching up to God. Seeking God for answers. Let me say this to you. You have not really desired change until you pray about it. You have not really desired change until you pray about it. Do you want to change your life? Do you want to change your story? Then pray. Number six, Ezekiah. We're moving very fast here. Ezekiah. <laughs> Listen. There are priests in Israel that when they give you a message, it is done. Can I say that to you? It is done. There is no need to be counting. When certain people give you a, a message, it is done. It's finished. Tell the last time. When, even in our days, if you receive a call. Bishop Elipo just speak to you directly. Some people believe it is done. Or oh, Apostle Sema. <laughs> it is done. It is done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I received the job already. You imagine you are in a Jerry conference and he calls you up and say, God tell me to tell you. <laughs> the way you will celebrate. You have not seen the baby, but you will celebrate. Why? Because you believe that those are God's prime men at this season. There is something called the prime man in Israel at that time. His name was Isaiah. Isaiah went to the king Hezekiah and said, put your house in order because you will die. Sephini. And he left. That was God's message. By that time, Hezekiah was already sick. So he knew that this sickness was going to lead to death. That's what you would think. Scripture says, the man was lying on his bed. Scripture says, he turned around and faced the wall and began to say to the Lord, remember, Remember how I have served you. Remember how I have built your temple. Remember how I have carried out certain things and certain reconstruction. Remember, oh God. And when he said, remember, you know what happened? Scripture says, Isaiah was going back home. You know those prophets? When they delivered the message, they just go. He was on his way home before he got home. Because a man prayed. The Lord said to him, Return and go and tell my servants that I've added another 15 years to his years. How did he buy it? You see, you can buy life. 
there is a place you can purchase life. It is in the place of prayer. It, it, they are destined for death. In fact, the man, the spirit of death had come. It was the end of it because the judgment had come. He had been waiting the balance. Death had come. But the man said, remember. Listen to this. You need to go and tell God, remember I've labored in your vineyard. Remember I have been faithful in serving you. Remember, oh God, he turned to the world. And the verdict was changed. You will find that story in Isaiah 38 from verse 1 to 5. Can I tell you about somebody else? The man by the name of Elijah. <laughs> Elijah, a dangerous man. The Bible says Elias was a man of like passion. And he prayed. Anytime I read the story of Elijah and they say he's a man of like passion. I don't like it because I don't believe it is truly a man of like passion. That man is something else. Elijah, a dangerous man. Elijah, the Tishbite. People thought the king was in power, but Elijah was in power. Elijah dictates what happened in Israel. Elijah stopped rain by himself. I think I preached a whole sermon on that. He stopped rain by himself in Israel. Imagine you being called king and you cannot even settle matters. How did he do that? By praying. Can I say to somebody today that prayer is the means of controlling the affairs of a family, a city, and a nation? By prayer, you can control the affairs of your business. By prayer, you can control the affairs of your life. I remember when I was in school and I was calculating my GPA as an under-level student and I was pursuing to one. And I remember this story that they did not record one of my courses. That they didn't record the CA. That's the continuous assessment. And in the exam, I think I had 42. I wasn't, that, I wasn't too brilliant. So, I went to this man and I said, I did to CA. And he said, no, that's, that's not my story. Then I, I just left him. Because I thought I was connected, because I, I was the class rep, I decided I was going to go to the level advisor and just, I would just take it on. And I was having that conversation. Are you following me? As I was having that conversation, I was talking to this lady who was a proselyte. That means she converted from Islam to Christianity. So she didn't know much. So I was talking to her. I was like the spiritual mentor. I mean, I was better than her. And I was saying, I said, listen, I was doing this thing, doing this thing. Can you believe this, this thing? If I just have 55, see? 3.56. I said, you see, you understand what I'm saying? I was trying to tell her. And then she said, have you prayed about it? I mean, it shook me. I had not even mentioned it to God in prayer. I didn't know that it was important. But that was where I learned the lesson that no matter how minute a thing is, you must talk to God about it. You know, some of us think that there are church matters, there are God matters, and there are not God matters. We think the issues that are so simple that we can solve with our connection, those issues are not God matters. But listen, I want to, I want to say to you that there are no matters that are not God matters. There are no issues that are no God issues. You must learn to talk to God at all times and in all seasons. And listen, when you see these things, you need to wonder the devil is against prayer. He really doesn't want us praying. Can I say to us, church, that the devil is fine with us having fun in church? He's happy seeing us dancing. He does not mind that you have a playlist that is spiritual. He doesn't care that you have planned a get-together. The devil does not really care. Sometimes he doesn't even bother that you read your Bible. But what he does not want you to do is to get into praying. Because he understood that when you get into praying, most especially when you begin to insist on the promises of God, then he's in trouble. Check the prayer meeting of a church, you have gotten the strength of that church. I'm sure you have heard that whatever goes up must come down. And I, I showed us from scriptures today, Revelation chapter 8, 4 to 5. The prayers of the saints ascend and the angels will return with thundering, sir. This was manifested in the life of Paul and Silas. They prayed and they sang. And God came down and tapped the floor in dancing. And there was an earthquake. Today I want to round up by just telling us a few men, stories of certain men. That get result, that got result uh, even from the place of prayer. Certain men. Some of them you have heard their names before. I just want this to inspire you. That if you can pray, you can get answers. 
Look around you, there are men who prays and get results. There are men around us who have prayed and have done what seems to be impossible. I tell people it is not your background that determines your location in the future. It is what you do with your life. Your background does not have to put your back to the ground. You and I can be better. We can live better and we can demand better because our God rules in the affairs of men. If you can pray, you can change the world because prayer is the staff of the believer even to work with God. Prayer is that one that we pull out and from it we get results. Let us look at men who pray. The first man I want to give you is the man by the name of John Wesley. Literally tens of millions of people are Christians today because of the work of John Wesley. Have you heard of Methodism? Have you heard of Methodist Church? Have you heard of the Anglican Church? The Wesleys were the founders of this. The tiny preacher had a big mission. He was famous for declaring, the whole world is my parish. The whole world is my parish. I mean, my father in the Lord will say, the whole world is my constituency. But then you can see now that you found it somewhere. Wesley will say, the whole world is my parish. Is my parish. I've had the up. Wesley spent two hours in his little room every morning. That's not so much time, right? Two hours in his room every morning. And it became known. His room became known as what is called the powerhouse of Methodism. Can I ask you, do you have a powerhouse? When life happens to you, where do you go to? Do you have a closet? Can you remember a film that was popular at that time? They call it War Room. And for a while, believers begin to... That's why I tell people that if it is not established in the world, it does not last. In the days of War Room, when everybody was raining like sorrow is raining now, all right? War Room was raining and everybody was talking about it. And people had closet. He said, do you have trouble? Do you have a war room? Do you have a war room? And everybody was, in fact, there were prayer meetings that were called war rooms. But today, no war room anymore. John Wesley had a powerhouse. Maybe we should not call it a war room. Maybe we should call it your powerhouse. That every time life happens to you, you are just looking forward to go back home. That it might, it might not be a, 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 a big room. It might just be a particular spot where you kneel. It might not be big. It might just be close to your cutting. A place where you just pray consistently and continually. No matter what buffet you know, if I can get back to my powerhouse, I'm going to set to it. You don't have faith in your powerhouse until consistency is built in the place of prayer. There is something called a place. There is an anointing of a place. Better was a place in scripture. Shiloh was a place in scripture, sir. Those were places, sir, where power is generated. Gethsemane was a place in Israel. You can also have your own place. You can have your Gethsemane. You can have your own place. You can have your Shiloh. You can have your own place. You can have your Bethel. My desire for you is that you have a place where you can pray. Another man is the man by the name George Muller. George Muller was a legendary prayer warrior. According to his autobiography, he had 5,000 answered requests every day. Your prayer point is five. You still forget them. 5,000. You know why? Muller had 117 schools and ran a group of orphanages that took care of 10,000 boys in, his, in, in England. 10,000. So you can see why his request would be that much. Every day he had to believe for supplies for what they will eat. Did you get that? Every day he had to believe for supplies of food. Every day. He retired at the age of 70. Became a traveling evangelist. Logging over 200,000 miles. Before the days of plague. Listen to this. Mola had five friends. I've told you about this before. Mola had five friends who have who are far from Christ and he committed to praying for them every day until they will become born again. Within 10 years, listen to this, after a few months, the first man came to Christ, five friends. Within 10 years, two more had come to faith. After 25 years, consistency in prayer. You know I said it? Prevailing prayers, consistency. After 25 years, one more was saved. How many do we have now? Four. 
But the fifth man was a holdout. Mola continued to pray every single day for 63 years and 8 months. Do you have anybody you love that much? For 63 years and 8 months, he was praying for him to give his life to Jesus. Mola eventually died. But listen, before his coffin was put in the soil, that means at his burial, the fifth man gave his life to Jesus. A prayer point of 63 years. And I come, people come to me to, for counseling and say they have been praying for two years. God does not answer prayers. 63 years and eight months. Mola believed in prayer. You see, for you to pray that long, it must be that you believe that God answers prayers. It must be your faith that keeps pushing you on. And Mola was a man of prayer. There's a man by the name of John Welch. He used to spend six to nine hours in prayers every morning. When his wife complained, because imagine marrying to that kind of person, six to nine hours, there's no how you will not complain. Six to nine hours every day pray. The, man, the wife complained. And he looked at the wife and said, I have 3,000 souls of men to labor for and to answer for. I need to pray. His church was a 3,000 membership church. So he said, I need to pray because I have 3,000 souls to answer for. There is a man by the name Brother Brian of Birmingham. They often call him Brother Brian. Brother Brian. A thief once came upon him and stole his watch and purse. He said, let us pray. And as he prayed, the thief returned the purse. Birmingham is also known for another statue. You know, there are many statues in Birmingham. And it is this of this man. Who was affectionately called Bra Brian. For more than 50 years, he served as a pastor in Turn Presbyterian Church. Country Marshall was referred to him as the patron saint of Birmingham. If anyone ever deserved that tattoo, it was him. Time will allow me to speak to you about a man by the name of John Knox, man of like passion. Perhaps more than anything else, John Knox is known for his prayer. Give me Scotland or I die. Have you ever prayed that kind of prayer before? I mean, you have signed your death for it with God. You have permission to kill me if you are not ready to give me Scotland. That's what happened. Give me Scotland or I die is like a death warrant. Listen, is it that you kill me or you give me Scotland? Have you been that desperate in the place of prayer? Not prayer was not an arrogant demand, but a passionate plea from a willing God to give. Not greatness lies in his own put dependence on our suffering God to save his people. As is evident from his preaching and prayer, Knox believed in the power of his preaching. Not in the power of the gospel or the power of God. He believed that when you preach and pray, that's when you get results. He was imprisoned, he was enslaved, he had gone through many battles. The 16th century in Scotland was known at the time of Reformation. Listen to this. And there was somebody called Queen Mary, who was the queen of the Scots. Listen to what Mary said. Mary said, I feared the prayer of John Knox more than all the assembled armies of Europe. That is the queen. He said, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than all the assembled armies of Europe. <laughs> your prayer, they don't even fear it in your neighborhood. Like I said, it is not in the shouting. Let me say this to you. The result of prayer and the result in prayers is built on consistency. I, if I can give you anything as your pastor and if I can pray anything into your heart is that you will have a prayer altar that burns. When we say prayer altar that burns, people think we are saying pray for 7 hours, 10 hours. No. Can you consistently be praying? If it's 30 minutes a day, can you keep it on consistently? Can your fire burn consistently? Because the result in prayer is by dependence even on consistency. 
I cast out devils, I do deliverance. I don't go around telling people that I'm a deliverance minister. But when we go around and we find devils, we cast them out with all the fullness of joy. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I used to say it in a very awesome way that if you go to the city of Ilonia and mention my name, perhaps the devils will begin to run. Because we cast them out so much that sometimes we get to a place and ask, are they here? Are they here? Why? Because the children of God must be free. We are called to freedom and not to bondage. What am I trying to say? It's simple. Is that I discover from the place of deliverance that, that if the devil understands that you are not determined that he should go, even if you pour fire on him and call the blood of Jesus, he knows that he will suffer for a while, but you are going to let him go. He's going to stay. And he's going to stay without suffering. You see, in the place of prayer, if you understand that you are just going to pray for two minutes, and then you will not pray again until next week. You know, many of us, when we come to church like this, you feel fired up. And you want to pray. You pray some more. But at a Tuesday, it's like a song we used to sing. I say on Monday, how much I want revival. And then I say on Sunday, how much I want revival. And then on Monday, I can't even find my Bible. Where's the power? The power of the cross in my life. You know, you say it on Sunday, I want revival. But on Monday, you can't even find your Bible. You say, where's the power? The power of the cross in my life. Consistency. Knox was a committed pastor and a church man. Let me tell you about a man by the name John Hyde. John Hyde was a partially dead man. But he prayed so much, they called him praying Hyde. Praying Hyde. He fell sent to the low caste of India. And he will pray, say, Lord, give me souls or take my soul. Give me souls or take my soul. Give me souls or take my soul. Imagine you are going on the road and you are walking by the street and you just hear a man saying, give me souls or take my soul. And perhaps he's been praying like that for seven hours. He's got into a time he's tired and he just said, give me souls. Oh, take my soul. Oh, give me, give me, give me, give me. You see, that's where CSC comes from. Give me, give me. He's tired. It's not that he wants to do vain repetition. It's that he has prayed so much, the energy has gone out. All he can say is, Lord, give me. Lord, answer me. Or, or he gets a prayer and says, soul, 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 soul. It's, it, it's, not, it's not something you, you have prayed for two minutes. And you have heard that soul, 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 soul. So keep quiet. That's tradition. That's tradition. Those our fathers didn't start that way. It was staying in the place of prayer. It was consistency. It was tiredness that came in. And the whole thing their spirit could take was just to say, Lord, so, Lord, so, 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 you, you do to me. Some people give me soul, take my soul, give me soul. I say, give me, give me, give me. So, 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 so. How do you do that? Because you have learned tradition. That was not how our father started. That was not what bought, batted that streamer. No. You, let me now tell you finally of another man as we close this service even today. And that person is you. I found you also as a man of life passion. I found you also as a man of prayer, you are saying, you know what, I can only pray a little. Can I say something to you? That your little prayers are pushing frontiers in your family. You can't see it yet, but it's doing great things. I've come to encourage you this morning to say that your prayers are doing so much and so greatly, even in your family. I need you to keep pressing in. Why? Because generations will write about you. You need to keep pressing in because your purpose will stand at last on the heart. I need you to keep pressing in because your business will also come forth. I need you to understand that as you go for every prayer meeting, as you labor in dozens of prayer meetings, you go from campground to campground. You go from mountain to mountain. You go from grounds to ground. You shut the door of your room. Your alarm keeps waking you up morning by morning. And you are saying, Lord, I can't find the result. I've come to hold your hand today like the hell of even the hand of Moses. I've come to say to you that don't give up yet. There are things that are happening in the spirit. You are already winning. You are already winning. There are battles that are no 
longer there because you have won already. You cannot give up now. Though you can't see the manifestation and the endless expectation of the creator, they wait for the manifestations of the sons of God. But I can assure you, in prayers, you're already building the foundation. You are laying the blocks. And when the joy comes, all the endless creation will rejoice with you. Don't give up. You are the next general. Can you help me look at your neighbor with fire in your eyes and say you are the next general? Each and every one of us could pray that prayer that can change history. Each and every one of us could change our world. Hebrews chapter 11. They say, they without us will not be made perfect. Ha! Even though they have done great exploit, without us, Christianity will not be much. Without you, that person will not give his life to Christ. Without Munira today, our sister will probably not come to church. You see, there are things that are dependent on us. There are things dependent on you. Generations, your family, your lineage story is dependent on you. So perhaps you are not a John I. Perhaps you are not called to change Scotland or Nigeria. Perhaps you are called to change the Adenese lineage. Perhaps your call is that you should change even your story. Your call, perhaps, is to stand on the gap and change your buffet means forever. Maybe that is God's call for your life. Maybe God's call for your life is that by your purpose, men can begin to worship God. Maybe by your purpose, men can begin to pray some more. Maybe by your purpose, poverty will be reduced in our land. Maybe by your own purpose and destiny, excellence will be made known as part of the spirit that God gives. Maybe by your purpose, wealth can be reclated and can be made plenty. Maybe by your purpose, God can liberate your city, your village, your family, your clan through you. Maybe that's God's call for you. Maybe that's God's purpose for you. Rather than trying to do it ourselves, can we stand on the shoulders of giants? Can we stand on the shoulders of those who have gone ahead of us? Can we stand on the shoulders of those who have travailed and have won kingdom? Can we say, Lord, we can also by you. We can subdue kingdoms. I know there are lions who are saying that they are ferocious. But there is yet a lion of the tribe of Judah. His name is Jesus. And with you, with him by your side, you can win. One minute, can you begin to say, Lord, I will stand. Lord, I will stand. If you can stand, can you stand on your feet uh, as a markup of prophetic demonstration? Uh, and can you say, Lord, I will stand. Uh, I will stand, my God. Uh, I will stand. Uh, I will stand. Uh, Bible says, have we done all to stand? Uh, stand therefore. Uh, you are the next uh, man of like passion. Uh, because you are praying, I will pray. Uh, because I find you praying, I will pray. Uh, because I find you praying, I will pray. Uh, because I find you praying, I will pray. Uh, on site, online, uh, wherever you are, can you say, Lord, I will take my space. Uh, Lord, I will take my place. Rokoto lokoto, adadadadakata, evrakala kata, ondrashe.